fight against crime. Good evening. We start with the unlikely gang, little, middle and large. The little one could be as small as five foot nothing. The large one could be as big as six foot three. Between the three of them, they murdered a wealthy businessman, one of the best known figures in West Yorkshire. We're showing how it happened, partly so that you can hear the dialogue, which just might clinch things for you. A Monday evening in Leeds, three months ago, and Liza Looper and a friend return home after taking Liza's new car out for a spin. It had been a present from her father. Look, don't worry. John Looper was well known in Leeds. His company helped manage Rio Ferdinand and Lennox Lewis, and John himself was a leading figure in the local Jewish community. No, I'm not sure. Hi, Mum. Hi. You have a nice time? Yeah. How's Sophie? Brilliant. She loves my new car. I'm just going to change into my pyjamas, then I'm going to come and watch Coronation Street with you. OK. Well, that's your decision. He didn't even John, bother to thank me. Don't forget to take the dog for a walk and don't come to bed too late. You have to go to London tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Liza, Liza, wake up. Mm, what, Mum? You need to go back to your own room. Your dad will be coming to bed soon. Around 11 o'clock, as usual, John took their terrier, Bisky, for a brief walk down Sanmore Drive. John? Don't move! 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 Don't move!
and then a separate fund which stands at £40,000 at the moment for information leading directly to the conviction of one or all of the gang members. Now let's come to the property in a moment, start with somebody who might know who did this and it's very likely after John died these guys would have will have talked a lot and perhaps talked about the planning of it as well. I mean, it's quite possible there's maybe 10, 20 people who know about this. There's £40,000 leading to the conviction of all of them or did you say just one of them? One or all. Just one or, or all. Supposing they don't want to give their names. They, they, they ring up and say, look, um, I've got this information but I, I can't say who I am. I would res I'd respect anonymity. The, the difficulty with that then is if people are anonymous we can't turn the information into evidence and we need to be able to turn the information that's given into evidence so that then that, that can lead on to payment for the reward. What I'm asking is that people trust me. Just give the information first. We can, we can deal then with the matter of anonymity or otherwise. As for the stuff that was stolen, we've got replicas of some of the stuff or similar things. Um, these watches, for example, are among those. The interesting thing is, is uh, two of the, the ones in the centre of this lot. There's the, uh, the gents Rolex yeah. Oyster. Yeah. But above all this uh, diamond-encrusted Cartier watch, it apparently uh, is, is really quite rare in the, in the form that it was stolen. Yeah, that's a ladies' Cartier. And in, there's only four being sold like that in the UK in the last year. The one that belonged to Mrs. Looper and was stolen during the course of this attack is actually unique, it's been customised with diamonds on the face and there are other um, peculiarities about it which make it actually unique in the country. Now I said little, middle and large, the big one, the yes. very, very big man, yes. seemed really put out by what had happened. I mean, I just wonder if he might call in. What do you reckon? I don't know, something changed during the course of the offence. This man is very distinguishable, he is massive, he calls himself huge. He was very dominant, very determined, very threatening to start with. And then something changed during the course of events that night and he became reluctant, apologetic, asking, can you ever forgive me? Something's changed. I don't know what he can tell me. OK, well, maybe he wants to call in and uh, try and get himself out of this as best he can. It's free to call the studio on 0500 600 600. It's also free to ring the instant room. We don't know if these guys are local or where they come from, but the instant room is in Leeds on 0500 040 999. Still to come, the boxing coach who met his death outside the ring. A London club that rips off clients. Give your wallet, mate. What? Give your wallet. And the customer who took revenge Plus, the mystery of the murdered grandfather, whose house was then set on fire. Here's a puzzle for you. We've got all the pieces but one. And if you can supply the missing bit, you'll help catch a multiple rapist. This is roughly what he looks like. We know he was in Edmonton, North London, two months ago. In fact, he was out and about very early on a Sunday morning. He's not British, but he may be Turkish or Eastern European and speaks only broken English. He's roughly six feet tall. He's slim, he has dark hair, he's a smoker, and an intimate detail, we know he sometimes wears long johns. But who is he? Seven weeks ago, he attacked a woman in her 60s. Well, I got up about half past four. Um, I went to the kitchen, had a cup of tea. I've got myself ready for work. That's, that's what I used to do. Rose, that's not her real name, works early and always has done. She's walked the same route to her job for 20 years. She really, really loved it. She's been doing it for a long time. Before, my mum was really confident, outgoing. She looked forward to going to work. CCTV shows two men in their 20s just behind her. Quarter to five, Sunday morning, seven weeks ago. Were you heading along the high road in Tottenham? Just behind them was the rapist. You don't walk along with your eyes shut that time in the morning. You know it's a hell of a lot. The two men behind Rose turned off into White Hart Lane. The rapist saw Rose and began to home in on her. It's only where um, I turn off from the high road that it is quieter. 
But I've always felt safe. You know, it's... No, I've always felt safe. Well, I heard footsteps and I was walking quite slow then. So I slowed down a bit more. I thought I'd let him pass. And he didn't pass. So I speeded up. And he didn't, it still didn't overtake me. That's what I'm going to get mugged here. So I slipped my bag off my shoulder into my hand to use it as a club. But as soon as he touches my shoulder, I'll hit him. Hey, you're a sexy woman, eh? Take your hands hey, off me! What's wrong with get you? off me! Get what's off wrong me! With you? Just a kiss. Just I couldn't speak very good English. Kiss. There was no one. No one come out. No one even put their lights on. Just a kiss. I didn't think I would get out of it. He strangled Rose until she lost consciousness. When she came to, he was raping her. And I thought... You want a cigarette? Give me one. I need a fag. Talk to him. <laughs> so I'll give him a fag. That's when I barely got up. Put some clothes on. I thought, this is it, it's finished. And it wasn't. And then as I walked... Was walking down the alleyway, and then he grabbed me again. No! <laughs> I didn't think I'd see my kids again, or my grandchildren. I didn't think I'd see anyone again. You pay me twenty pounds. <laughs> you pay me twenty. I've got any money. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. <laughs> He walked me up the steps and over the bridge and down to the road where I go down to work. I didn't know what was going to happen again. I couldn't even understand why he was letting walk in with me. After being raped twice, Rose was then submitted to a third sexual assault. There was scaffolding at the time, but it took place on the corner of the street. In that minute, it's changed my life. It's, my life's changed at that minute there. What I was is gone. So who is he? There are more clues that just might help. We think he stole Rose's gold earrings. This is roughly what they look like. Police have DNA, so if you've got a name, it's either the right one or it's easily eliminated. Don't hesitate. Remember, he strangled Rose. He could have killed her. 0500 600 600 or the instant room on 020 8345 4604. And don't forget, if you've been the victim of crime, the victim support line is on 0845 30 30 900. Now, here's DC Jackie Hames. We've four more faces for you now, all wanted for very serious offences across the UK. See if you can tell us where they are tonight. Gary Salmon may know something about a fatal shooting at a pub in Nottingham. He's worked as a labourer and as a second-hand car salesman and sometimes goes by the name of Fish or Gary McKenzie. We're so anxious to trace him, we've put his face on the back of buses in the Birmingham, Nottingham and Derby areas, where we know he has connections. There's a reward for, for, for up to £10,000 for information leading to his arrest. We have reason to believe that David Brown is responsible for a one-man crime wave. Several of my colleagues want to talk to him about more than 100 frauds from Cumbria to Devon, as well as at least one sexual assault. He stays in pubs, befriends the landlord and then steals cash and checkbooks. He's six foot one, has a strong Yorkshire accent and receding hair which he dyes. Michael Feeney is wanted by Staffordshire Police, who consider him to be a danger to young women and girls. He's 5 foot 10, 50 years old and used to work as a fireman. He has a Midlands accent but travels all over the UK. But please be especially vigilant if you live in the Midlands area. And this is Baldave Sinclair. We'd like to talk to him about a string of deception burglaries. Documents are stolen and the victim's identities have been used to secure bank loans and buy sports cars. Baldave Sinclair has a hooked nose with scars on it and several tattoos. He was dismissed from his job in an electricity company but sometimes uses his old uniform and ID card. He's known to be violent and carries weapons so please don't even think about approaching him but if you have any information on him or indeed any of our other faces please call us 0500 600 600. When you see our next appeal you might initially 
have sympathy for the criminal. After all, he's just been fleeced in a rip-off joint in London, Soho. But nothing in the world can justify what happened after that. Come on, come downstairs, five pounds. No good time, really good time, come downstairs. Do you want to come in? Come on, come in. Come on, come in. Hi, love, how are you? All right, Camille, how are you doing? You working all this week? Yeah, I need the money, darling. Once we're, we're ready, we'll go upstairs to the door, um, start calling people in. If someone looks or looks like they're interested in coming in, um, we'll use um, our finger a lot, because that seems to help to call them in, like... Camille would be one of two girls who'd work a shift normally. They would take turns working the door 15 minutes about. And during that time, the girl who isn't working would be down in the bar area relaxing. On a typical day, the girls would work between 11 and 6, or between 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. at evening. It would be the duty of the girl on the door to try and entice male clients into the club. So tell me, what's a nice guy like you doing walking by himself? Just out for a walk, baby. Yeah? Yeah. Do you want to come in for a chat with me? Uh, I don't think so. It's only five pounds, you know? Five pounds? Five pounds. Well, you do look good. Go on, you know you want to. Let's go. She got in a lot of uh, clients. I mean, she was quite popular with customers. There was a lot of the girls have different um, types that they would bring in, but Camille didn't really have one, like, typical type of customer. She'd talk to everyone. Give the man a fiver. See, told you it was only going to be five pounds, didn't I? Come in, darling. Sit down. Make yourself nice and comfortable. Oh, so have you got a girlfriend? Hello, baby. Hey. Are you happy with her or are you looking for something else? Nah, she do just fine. But you know what? Come back. I might have something for you later, yeah? Mm. Hey. See ya. Oh, cute guy like you, single. Here's your bill, sir. Bill? What for? Mm -hmm. £375. You're paying it? No. I didn't do nothing. She never said it was going to cost this much. You're paying it. Guess you want it, mate. What? Guess you want it. <sighs> 90 quid, is that it? Guess it's ten. Look, take that and don't come in places like this until you're more than 80 quid a week. Now, piss off. Go on. Come on. Get yourself on. On the first occasion when the male leaves the club, he walks along Rupert Street towards the Apollo Theatre. At this point, he makes a phone call on the mobile. A short while later, he returns. As he approaches the Blue Bunny Club, he puts his hands up in a submissive nature. I believe this is because he recognises the girl on the door is not Camille, and he has no issue with the girl who is now on the door. He then takes two steps backwards, turns and walks back towards Rupert Street. On the third occasion that the male approaches the club, Camille is working on the door. His pace quickens, and he darts inside the club entrance. Hey, you know, yes. <laughs> this is where the attack takes place. Look, 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 look. A couple of seconds later, he runs along Archer Street, turning left into Great Windmill Street, towards Shaftesbury Avenue, emerging in Piccadilly Underground Station. This is DCI Steve Morris, who's in charge of the case, along with Camille's mother and sister, Doit and Debbie. Doit, I'm, I'm so sorry. You've had to come to England under these circumstances. You've actually just flown in from Jamaica for, for this appeal, and it must have been an appalling shock when you got the news yes, about Yes, it is. It is. The guy that stabbed Camille, Camille has died with a wound, but it has left in my heart. 
I am appealing to the public, to the people, parents, anyone I've seen that guy or heard anything, please to call into the police because you're the only one can help to heal that wound in my heart. Please call into the police. Thank you. Debbie, your sister was really a, a teacher, a teaching assistant in Jamaica. Yes. Why did she come to the UK? Well, she came to the UK to study further studies in education right. and to become a nursery assistant, nursery no, she, teacher here. She was doing that up in she Birmingham? She was actually doing that up in Birmingham. And you had no idea she was travelling to London? She'd only been doing this, coming to London for a few weeks, apparently. That was what I you was had no doing. idea she was doing that? I had no idea what she was doing down in London, no. Tell me what sort of a girl she was. She was really wonderful. She was very friendly, very outgoing, very confident. And she liked to take care of people. She used to live with me and she used to take care of me. All my friends thought she was just the best. You know, she was always doing stuff for me, calling me to find out how I was feeling, asking if I was okay, if I needed anything. She was just always there for me. If I had anything to say or do, she would get it done for me if I didn't have the time. She was my best friend. She was everything to me, basically. Steve, you've got a description of a killer from the people at the club, you've got an, an, an EFIT. Tell us what you know about him. We know this man is black, between five foot six to five foot eight. And so he's, he's fairly small, small to medium. Yes. And sorry, and age? Uh, in his early 20s. Now, there was somebody captured on CCTV at Piccadilly Underground Station who you want to at least eliminate from the inquiry. Tell us about him. That man was wearing a very distinctive jacket. Actually, we've got, a, uh, got one very similar, and maybe even identical. This has been flown over from Cleveland, Ohio. It's the Cleveland Indians, and it, this is identical to the jacket. That is, yes. Now, if that guy was nothing to do with the murder, for heaven's sake, give us a call now, 0500 600 600. Say, look, that's my jacket, that was me, but nothing, nothing to do with, with Camille. Also a man who walked into Kennington Police Station two days after the murder. Tell us why you're interested in him. I really need to speak to this man. He has some significant information about this murder. Uh, the details that he gave when he went in suggest that he does know something. I'm prepared to meet this man anytime, anywhere. He or somebody on his behalf just needs to contact us and we'll, and we'll meet and we'll discuss it. OK, well, 0500 600 600. Or you can call the instant room on 020 8358 0100. Now to uh, a newcomer to the programme, PC Jonathan Morrison. Welcome to Crime Watch. Thanks, Nick. I'm really pleased to be here. Good evening. Tonight, I've CCTV of armed robbery, deception and theft. See if you can help me find these people. First, an armed robbery at the Coral Bookmakers in Dagenham, East London. A man walks up to the counter and threatens a member of staff with a handgun. A second man lingers by the door to keep an eye on customers, although he's not clearly seen on the CCTV. They run off with over £100 in cash. Do you know this man? Next, to Darlington, and deception at a branch of going places where a man is withdrawing thousands of pounds worth of euros with a bank card stolen early that day. Two weeks later, the same man is seen as a branch of the Royal Bank of Scotland using another stolen card. Do you recognise him? Swindon now, and another deception. Detectives would like to speak to this man in connection with a number of thefts and use of stolen bank cards to obtain cash and buy high-value jewellery. He's seen here at a branch of Thomas Cook withdrawing £900 worth of euros. It's believed he's responsible for a series of similar deceptions throughout Berkshire and Wiltshire. Who is he? Finally, to South Manchester and theft of computer equipment. Three smartly dressed men enter an office building. At first, they take a wrong turn down a corridor. Then they bump into a cleaner who, thinking they work there, opens up an office for them. They manage to walk out of the building with thousands of pounds worth of computer hardware. Do you know who they are?
If you can help with any of these cases, please call 0500 600 600. Our next case is a real mystery. A year ago, a grandfather, Derek Cox, was murdered at his home in Reading. His body and his house were then doused in petrol and set on fire. This CCTV shows the house exploding into flames at a quarter to 11 in the evening. On this first anniversary, police are still unable to find any clues as to why anyone would want to kill him. Well, this is Derek's son, Rick Cox, and DCI Andy Taylor. We thank you very much for coming in. I know this is something of an ordeal for you. Tell us a bit about what your dad was like. Um, <clears throat> dad was a, a, a doting grandfather, uh, a devoted father, and uh, very much our best friend, a huge part of our lives. Uh, he was a very gentle man uh, with a wicked sense of humour, and he very much thrived on friendships with people from all walks of life. Have you any idea why anyone would want to do this? Absolutely no idea at all. Uh, there wasn't a bad bone in, in Dad's body, absolutely at a loss with it. Andy, what about you? I mean, as far as the motive goes? We are keeping an open mind as to the motive. You've heard Rick say um, what a nice guy his dad was, uh, and we're working uh, to the assumption that it was probably a burglary that went wrong. Uh, we know that Derek arrived home at about 8.30pm on Sunday, the 11th of May last year, um, and the explosion was at about 10.45pm the same evening. Um, so really we're looking for anyone that was around at that time and particularly around the 22.45, 10.45 p.m. time that saw anyone running around uh, in Lowfield Road. And there's also an uh, image of a man on CCTV that you want help with tonight. Yeah, about 40 minutes before the explosion, so we're talking about 5 past 10 in the evening on that Sunday, uh, there's a chap walks up the side of uh, the alleyway, the side of, of Derek's house, out onto Lowfield Road. Now, he may hold information which is vital to the inquiry, so we'd ask him to come forward. And a car as well. You're interested in finding out more about a car. Yeah, there was a stolen car recovered in Lowfield Road, uh, which was a silver-blue Vauxhall Cavalier, and that was F-registered, and that was stolen from Wokingham at about 2 p.m. on the day of the murder. But what would you say to, to, I mean, perhaps the person listening, we don't know, but to, to whoever did this? This is a, a huge loss to his family, the consequences of which we will take to our own graves. Uh, if there's anybody out there that can shed any light on this, then please contact the police. OK, well, Rick, thanks. And Andy, thank you both very much. Please call us now, 0500 600 600, or the Reading Instant Room on 01189 181 752. Now let's see what progress we've made so far on tonight's cases. Here's DC Jackie Haynes. Well, I've been a detective a long time and I've dealt with a lot of rapes over my, uh, my career and the one that we showed today in, uh, in Edmonton really is appalled and shocked me as much as it has all of you because look at the number of calls we've had already. Um, this was on the 4th of April in Edmonton and we've, we asked for people to look at the CCTV and the EFIT. We've actually had a police officer from Dover's rung in and uh, he feels he's, got a, uh, he's investigating an event that's very, very similar in MO and description to this one. So we're going to be putting him in touch with the detectives here. Don't forget, we will be able to eliminate anyone you put forward really quickly. So thank you so much, but keep ringing in. Jonathan, what have you got? There's lots of calls coming in on the murder of the Leeds businessman, John Looper. The police are very interested in one caller who said the, the same thing happened to them in the Yorkshire area. The same methods and, and expressions were used. Also, another caller thinks they've seen Mrs. Looper's stolen jewellery for sale. As you can see, the studio number is on the screen. And if you're watching on digital satellite TV, you can email us directly through your remote control. Just press the red button on your handset and choose Crime Watch. Still to come, the boxing coach who met his death outside the ring. How murder came to a Cornish village. And the vast collection of valuable stamps stolen from a houseboat. Some months we have huge amounts of progress to report, other months it's a little bit harder to say. We had a lot of calls during the last programme and a lot of information, but most of it's still under investigation. We can, though, tell you about new results from programmes earlier this year. First, back to March, where we showed a photo of Delroy Edwards, wanted over an allegation of an assault on his ex-partner's two-year-old child. We can't show his picture tonight because of ongoing legal proceedings, but following Crime Watch, Delroy Edwards handed himself into the police. 
Also in March, CCTV of a man wanted for deception in the Lloyd's TSB in Stockton Heath. He used information that had been discarded by a previous customer to withdraw cash. The same person was named 12 times by Crime Watch viewers. Back in February, we showed CCTV of someone suspected of using a stolen credit card to make purchases in Stratford-upon-Avon. As a direct result of Crime Watch, a police officer put forward a name. The woman has now been arrested and charged with burglary. Actually, we've been checking on how successful Crime Watch is, what proportion of our appeals are solved by Crime Watch viewers. The result looks even better than we'd thought, and we'll have the full figures next month in time for our 20th anniversary. But here's a case that's been solved independently of Crime Watch. You may recall the reconstruction of a sex attack in a church in Glasgow. We showed it in March three years ago, and it has a powerful lesson for anyone who's ever the victim of a sex attack. A Canadian student in Glasgow had a phone call from her family to say her grandfather had died. She went to St Mungo's Church in the city centre to find solace. Oh, Be quiet! What the hell are you doing? He punched her, broke her nose, then sexually assaulted her. We were very fortunate because the victim came very quickly after the attack to the police, which meant we were able to recover vital forensic evidence, which in fact led to a DNA profile, which we compared with the national database uh, and although there was no match at that time, I felt confident that we'd get a match if this person came to the attention of the police again. And he was right. A year and a half later, a man was stopped not far from St Mungo's and arrested for a breach of the peace. As routine procedure, they swabbed him for DNA. It showed that the savage attack 20 months previously had been carried out by Joseph Craig, who'd promptly gone abroad. Seven months ago, he pleaded guilty to serious sexual assault and was sentenced to five and a half years. I would give the advice to any victim who'd suffered a sexual attack to report the matter immediately to the police. That would allow us to recover vital forensic evidence, which may lead to the identification of the attacker at a later time. And now another sex crime that's been solved, except this time we still need your help. Two weeks ago, two men were sentenced to the Old Bailey for a total of 23 years for a series of rapes and indecent assaults on teenage girls. Dominic Adimora, a club promoter in South East London, would persuade girls to come back to his flat by telling them that they'd make ideal models for a music promotion photo shoot. Except that once he got there, he'd ply them with alcohol and rape them. His youngest victim was 13 years old. His friend, Samuel George Will, was also involved in one of the attacks. Detectives now believe that there were more victims who haven't yet come forward, perhaps many more. This is DS Mick Willard. How many more do you think and why do you think there are in Mick, more when victims? we uh, searched Eddie Mora's flat, we found uh, hundreds of photographs of young girls. But more importantly, we found about 40 photographs um, showing young girls probably aged 13 to 16 in very provocative poses. It's those girls that we wish to come forward. 40 at least. About now, 40. we don't know that they were all raped, but of course, given the, the MO, the modus operandi he used that you do know about, it's quite possible they were sexually assaulted in large numbers. And the fact they haven't come forward to the police means presumably they were deeply upset and deeply ashamed. It perhaps didn't even tell their parents. Quite, quite possibly, Nick. We found that in the previous cases. They found it very difficult to tell their parents what happened. Um, How they turned up at a strange man's flat and showed yeah. themselves and started taking their clothes off? They basically, they broke the rules at home. Um, but nonetheless, we still need them to come forward, um, either to be eliminated or to tell us about any crimes that's happened to them. Now, these, these girls, still, still very young, maybe quite frightened and quite worried about t telephoning you here at the studio, or telephoning the local police. Just tell them what it involves. Well, if they can get in contact with us, we've got specially trained officers that can deal with them. Uh, we make initial assessment by a detective um, and then we can offer all sorts of support and some help. But the main thing is we won't go forward, we won't take the investigation forward unless we have their consent. OK, and of course the one thing you ought to know is complete anonymity for anybody who complains that they have been raped or sexually assaulted. So your name will never come out. You can call us here in confidence on 0500 600 600 or on the instant room on 020 8284 8563. Who killed Joe Montague? It's a year since a murder in Coventry mystified police, family and friends. All we know is that Joe was a boxing trainer and evidently someone didn't like him.
Boxing's a very popular at the minute. There must be about, about 15 professional boxing in Coventry. Joe played a big part in bringing the big shows to Coventry. There must have been about a thousand people there, and it was packed out, it was packed out, and the atmosphere was absolutely brilliant, like, you know? It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Man, you're doing well. Keep it up. Keep on top. This is why we've been training three times a day. This is your night. Keep it up. Go on out there, but be faster. <laughs> Joe had trained Tony well, months, months beforehand that fight. You know, every day he was out with Tony Conroy, three times a day, every morning in the gym in the afternoon, gym at night. In the atmosphere, is electric, electric, and uh, you know, when Tony won the fight, the crowd just went wild. Joe, well done for tonight. You off to the bar? No, I'm going to go round to Joanne's. Etta's been with her all day. You have fun, though. Cheers. We'll raise our glasses to you. Well done again, mate. You must be pleased. Yeah! Despite the celebrations, Joe left to visit his grown-up daughter, who has MS. She'd been poorly that day, and his wife had gone round to stay with her. How did you get on? It was amazing. We got four wins. Conroy was on top form. He's got the Midland title. Oh. But enough of that. Are you going to be comfy if you stay here? Yes, there? yes. I've got all my stuff with me. Off you go home. Get a good night's sleep. Mm, if you're sure. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. Good night, love. I'll be round first thing. Joe drove to his home in the north of the city, arriving just after midnight. He was shot six times right outside his house. He wasn't just a boxing trainer, he was like a... He was like a real good friend. He was a, like, a real good friend to all the boxers he trained. There's something definitely missing, like, you know, in the gym now about him. You know, we absolutely miss him terribly. Well, Martin Slevin is one of the senior detectives still on the case after a year. And Martin, even after all that time, you're still struggling, really, a bit to find out as to why anyone would want to do this. Yes, uh, we've looked into Joe's past in great depth, and uh, he was a well-known boxing trainer in the city and was a well-known figure within the city of Coventry, but there's nothing we've uncovered that would lead us to a positive motive as to why Joe was killed. So what clues have you got as to who the gunman might be? We know that a car uh, parked on Red Lane in Coventry at around 23.36 hours on the forecourt of the commercial window company, and that as Joe returned home and was shot, a man was seen to run from Newdigate Road into Red Lane, and we believe he got into the same vehicle and drove off in the direction of Stony Stanton Road. But what that car tells you, the key thing, is you don't think this gunman acted alone? No. We know that the gunman got into the rear passenger seat of that vehicle, which indicates that there's at least one other assailant involved in this offence. Now, what about um, the, the bullets that we use? It was six bullets in total, wasn't it? Yes. Because this is one of the bullets, or, or uh, this is identical, <coughs> sorry, to, to one of the bullets that was used, and it's pretty unusual, isn't it? Yes, we know that the bullets used in this offence were manufactured in Canada sometime between 1974 and 1989. They're quite unusual. They're Dominion 0.38 S&W, and they're copper wash bullets. Um, and we know that the gun used in this offence was a Colt or Colt copy revolver. That combination together, we're led to believe, is quite unusual in the UK. So really anyone who, who might have sold these or a dealer dealing in, in, in those kind of bullets, those kind of guns? Yeah, we would uh, appeal to anyone that's had that combination of uh, ammunition and weapon either stolen or any firearms dealers that knows of anyone they've sold that to or, or has possession of that uh, combination of weapon and ammunition. And another thing you know the, the gun was using was a piece of green base. It looks a bit like the kind of green base you find off a snooker table, though it isn't. It's slightly different, isn't it? But was using this, this 
green baize material as well? Yes, we know that the offender wrapped the revolver in a, a material very similar to that and fired through that material and a number, a number of pieces were left at the scene. And we believe that was to either muffle the sound or to stop firearms residue from uh, going onto the assailant. But that together with the weapon and the uh, bullets is probably significant. We'd, we'd like to appeal for that com people that know anyone with that combination to please come forward and speak to us. So it's putting all that together with the car, the small uh, hatchback, wasn't it? Yes, I believe it, it was a small hatchback type vehicle, possibly silver in colour, which sped off towards Stony Stunton Road just after midnight on the 8th of June 2003. Okay, well call us if you can help, call us if you know a motive, and above all, call us if you know who did it. 0500 600 600 or 0121 200 2552. Now here's PC Jonathan Morrison and DC Jackie Haynes. We've got the faces, have you got the names? James Brodie is wanted in connection with the murder of Marion Bates, the Nottingham jeweller who was shot during a raid on her shop last September. He's also wanted for three other armed robberies and also a racist attack. He's 20, 6 foot 1 and slim. He's a joiner by trade and known to have worked on building sites. He has connections in Scotland and sometimes speaks with a Scottish accent. Salim Mzi is charged with indecently assaulting two children aged 11 and 14. He failed to appear at Northampton Magistrates Court last October. He's 25 years old, has a scar on his nose and everyone knows him as Sam. He used to work in a warehouse in Northampton and it's believed he's still doing similar work somewhere in Leicestershire. In February last year, Francis Berry pleaded guilty to conning an 86-year-old woman and burgling her home. He disappeared before sentencing and is now wanted for questioning about another burglary in Lancashire. He's 24, six foot tall, speaks with an Irish accent and has connections in Wrexham, North Wales. And Mark Mathurin is wanted in connection with drugs offences. When colleagues tried to stop his car in Cambridgeshire, he drove off at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour. Not surprisingly, he crashed and was then chased across a field, throwing away a large amount of cocaine as he ran. He's 34, 5 foot 10, muscular and has a tattoo of a stallion over his back. He has family connections in Gloucester and London, but we, may, we believe he may be in Spain. So if you're off there on your summer holidays, do keep a look out for him, but please don't approach him. 0500 600 600 if you know where you can find any of these men. For our next appeal, we're taking you inside a crime scene that has never been seen before. It's in a part of the UK we don't actually feature much on Crown Watch because it's relatively tranquil. But seven months ago, North Cornwall was rocked by a double murder. Carol and Graham Fisher were shot at their home near Wadebridge. Carol and Graham were devoted, a, a lovely couple. They were very private people. We were never invited into the, their bungalow. I think they were just really happy in their own company and uh, just happy together. The couple had a little business selling petrol since the day they were married 25 years ago. Stuart Newbury is leading the investigation. So Graham and Carol Fisher, they used to operate from this garage. It's called Perch Garage and it's on okay. the main A39 road. And uh, the nearest town is Wade Bridge, which is about a mile that direction. And the Royal Cornwall Showground. And then in the other direction, we, we uh, are off to Newquay. As you can see, it's uh, all boarded up, but on the night of the 5th of November, uh, the garage would have been operating normally. And uh, Graham and Carl, their normal routine would be to lock up the pumps and then put out the cones to discourage uh, vehicles from coming on the forecourt. And then we believe that that night, uh, Graham came out of the side door, locked up, and then went into the bungalow 30 or 40 yards away. On the day of the murder, it was around about 20 to 7, a telephone went and uh, it was Carol. I got a parking ticket and we had a bit of a laugh over it. Um, as she always saw the funny side of things. As she put Graham on and they seemed perfectly relaxed and that was the last time I spoke to them. Um, they obviously had no idea of uh, what might happen to them. Police in Cornwall are investigating a double murder after husband and wife were found shot dead at the garage they ran near Wadebridge. Post-mortem examinations have been carried out on the bodies of Carol and Graham Fisher. 
So as you can see, this uh, window here has all been boarded up. This was actually smashed uh, by uh, one of the perpetrators uh, during the attack, uh, and a planter uh, was pushed through. This was full of earth, and it ended up on the sofa inside the lounge. This is video taken by the police the day after the murder. They've released it tonight for the first time in the hope that it might prompt someone's conscience. So here we are in the lounge, and as you can see, it's all set up for evening meal, and it looks as though this is their routine to have the dinner in front of the television, and when we came here on the 6th of November, the television was switched on. It looks as though the gunman broke the glass in the kitchen door and first shot Graham. We think that Carol probably came across to tend to him and she was struck on the head, uh, but she managed to get up and go into the lounge. Over here, we've got the telephone where we think that Carol actually tried to make a 999 call. She misdialed, unfortunately, and uh, when she replaced the receiver, it looks as though she was shot. She was shot in the left hand. Uh, but she managed to get out of this room to go to another part of the bungalow. In this cupboard in the hallway, there's a safe, and we found the safe door open with a key in the door, and the papers from the safe were strewn across the floor here. Also in the safe, there was about £2,000, quite evident but untouched. Carol was running for her life, but as she made her way to the porch door, she was shot in the back. Even so, she managed to stagger towards the main road. This is where Carol was found. It looks as though she'd come along this path and probably stumbled and fallen, and she'd actually been shot here in the neck uh, by the gunman. And not content with that, she's been battered around the head by some heavy object. And that was the same fate uh, that Graham suffered. Uh, they actually both died of severe head injuries. It, it's just dreadful, horrendous. I still really can't believe it. Um... I can certainly hear their voices still, and particularly Carol. She had such an infectious laugh. It was such a dreadful crime. We just have to catch these people. Well, here's Stuart Newbury in the, in the studio now. It, it's almost a cliche to say a community is, is rocked by a murder, but in this case, seven months on, the whole area is still sort of still in shock about this. It really did shock Cornwall. The, the brutality involved in this case is, is horrified everyone. And we're so careful on crime when we can be to try and reassure people because we, we focus so many crimes into this single, single hour. Actually, the, the level of brutality, the callousness of this is actually very frightening. These men are still at large. They not only shot them again and again, they went on and battered them and battered them. Sure, it, it was almost overkill. So we've got people who are you know, almost psychopathic in the way that they, they behave. Family or, or friends, if they've got an idea who they are, presumably won't want to be living with someone like that. You never know. Well, what I'm hoping is that the, 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 the sort of people we'll reach tonight may have information which directly leads us to the offenders. I'm convinced that uh, whoever's responsible must have confided in somebody talking about planning to do this, this sort of thing. Uh, and indeed, after the, the crimes were committed, probably somebody else uh, knows something about this crime and I'm appealing for that type of individual to come forward. It's absolutely essential we catch these people. It is uh, this sort of near psychopathy, this, I mean, this appalling level of violence is... Uh, and the commando raid in which it took place, with, the, you know, the, the things bursting in through the door and someone else through the window. I mean, even in the height of the troubles in, uh, in 1972 in Northern Ireland, I mean, violence like that was, well, was very rare. It's hard to imagine um, what Mr and Mrs Fisher endured that night. They must have known what their fate was going to be and Mrs Fisher was desperately trying to get out of the bungalow and uh, she was shot twice as she got out of the bungalow. You're still not really clear of the motive. They had a lot of money but it was in the bank and they, they didn't inherited yes, that. Yes, they you... did. They, they did have money that they'd inherited and assets that they'd inherited. But what we don't know is, is what they may have had in, in the bungalow that, that perhaps was stolen. There was cash actually left in the safe that was untouched, uh, which we're really intrigued about. And curiously, they left two guns behind. Um, th th there was a proper shotgun license at, at the cottage. Yes, there was. The guns are stored so that the stocks are kept separately from the barrels. Yes. They'd left the barrels and taken the stocks. The stocks were taken, which is another mystery. Uh, they were found three days later. 
uh, they'd been stuffed into a hedge about a mile away from the scene. Uh, so that, that's a complete mystery. And very, very hard to explain why anybody would do that. Um, uh, there is a reward on this for £10,000, but the, the main thing is to try and catch these people before they do something like this again. It's a very, very unusual crime anywhere in the United Kingdom, let alone in Cornwall. Uh, it happened, may I remind you, on bonfire night last year. If there's any way you think you can help, call us here. The number's on the screen. And the instant room in Bodmin is on 01208 264 228. I used to enjoy collecting a few stamps when I was young, but nothing on the scale of this. A month ago, a whole stack of albums like these were stolen from Paul Chaplin's home in Ely in Cambridgeshire. Painstakingly, he built the collection up bit by bit. If he wanted to replace it all, it would cost him something like £200,000. The stolen albums weigh around 76 kilos, which, just to give you an idea, weigh uh, quite a good bit more than me. Now, Paul, am I right in saying that your collection had every stamp that had ever been designed for Great Britain, ever, the whole lot. Every design and every watermark. And most of them mint, never been used, never been franked. The whole collection, there was only eight that were actually used, the rest were mint completely. So how did it happen? How did they go? <laughs> um, I went to visit a friend in Scotland, Alan, and uh, I flew Friday night, came back Sunday, and the house had been broken into, and the collection had gone. And not easy to say, as we used to say, that, that it oh, weighed an absolute ton. I shouldn't think there was just one person because of the volume. And it, I think it must have been two people. Well, two people, maybe more, we just don't Possibly know. Now, now give us, we've got some replicas of, of some of the stamps you had. I mean, which would have been among the most valuable? Um, the 1882 pound. Um, this one, this is a Victorian one. This Victorian, yeah, 1882, issued in 1882, is... Uh, quite rare, probably only five or six mint quality ones known in the world and worth around £65,000. Really? What about these here? These are called, you, you gave me a little bit of information about these beforehand, were they uh, Pound Browns? Pound Browns, yeah, 1888. The only difference between the two was the watermark and the Orbs watermark, um, probably ten quality ones mint in the world. One of them was mine. Um, Forty thousand pound. Really? Yeah. It was a stamp with a type of pound. A stamp worth a pound in Victorian times. That was, well, was yeah, going to send I mean, an awful lot, wasn't been, it? Well, a month's wages for someone. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of money. And to amass this quantity of stamps, I mean, how did you get into this collecting stamps? Um, my auntie started me off when I was eight years old. She gave me her collection, and I just worked away at it from there. Really, um, just became totally absorbed. And I don't know how much time would you spend on it every week. <laughs> Probably 20 hours. Really? Mostly weekends, but, yeah. And didn't watch TV. Didn't watch TV. <laughs> well, you, you put up your own reward, haven't you, tonight? I have, yeah. I'd gladly pay £10,000 to get the GB, the Great Britain collection, the mint collection, back. Would be absolutely marvellous. Well, you say you didn't watch much TV. Let's hope someone who is watching tonight who can help. The sheer weight of what was stolen suggests there's more than one thief, and surely they must have known about Paul's collection, especially since other property was left behind. If you're a dealer, please be on the lookout for stamps like these. 0500 600 600 or the instant room in Cambridge on 01480 456 Michael Feeney, if you're watching, I'd give yourself in if I were you. We've got uh, all sorts of information coming in about where you work and where you live and all sorts of other things. Uh, Baldev Singh Clare, we've also got very interesting information on where he works. Gary uh, Simon, more information, addresses and heaven knows what, and on the blue bunny murder of Camille Gordon. Really interesting there, including a new witness. All the incident room numbers are on CFAX on page 621. You can see a, a reminder of some of tonight's cases and some crime prevention advice and a good deal more by going to bbc.co.uk forward slash crime. Finally, can you help track down one of these? This magnificent creature is a goshawk brought in by Alan Ames. Alan, thank you very much. And a similar one was stolen from an aviary in Seton Carew near Hartlepool just over a week ago. Raiders bypassed an elaborate alarm system and broke through a shed wall to snatch the goshawk from its perch. The stolen bird is female, and her owner says she'll be very distressed at being taken away from her usual surroundings. Could even die from shock. This beautiful goshawk here is used to being out and about and around people. The stolen one is registered. 
and so it can't be sold without official documentation. It can be identified by two aluminium rings, one on each foot. If you have any information about her whereabouts, please call 0500 600 600 or you can call the Hartlepool Incident Room on 01642 302 126. Three minutes to ten or thereabouts. Our phone lines are open until midnight tonight and from 7.30am tomorrow until midnight tomorrow and again all day on Friday. The next month's programme will be on Tuesday the 22nd of June. We'll be looking back on 20 years of Crime Watch. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch UK. Now, if you've ever worried or complained about crime, this is your chance to do something about it. Yeah, he hasn't changed a bit, has he? Oh, I was on just day release from school when they filmed that. <gasps> well, uh, we'll be looking back, but we'll also be looking forward next month on asking you to help catch six of the UK's most wanted criminals. Don't wait till next month, though. We'll be back tonight in just over half an hour with Crime Watch Update. If you can't join us, then do remember the sort of crimes we feature are very rare. Dead of nightmares. Sleep well, please. Good night. Good night.